The registration link can be found in the description of the Nantucket Government TV YouTube live feed for the meeting. People registering must use their names, otherwise they will not be allowed to participate. Attendees will join in a listening mode and then can click their raise their hand button if they wish to speak. The chair will call on those who have raised their hands in the order in which they were raised. Uh, I will now confirm member access, starting with the select board in the order in which I see you. Um, Jason Bridges. Present. Melissa Murphy. Here. Christy Farantella. Here. Matt Fee. I see Matt coming in. Hey, Matt, can you hear me? Yes. Um, next, um, we have um, for town staff this evening, Erica Mooney. Amy Baxter. Here. Tucker Holland. Here. Jericho Mele. Present. Brian Turbett. In attendance. Libby Gibson. Present. David Gray. Here. And we also have John Giorgio, our town council with us this evening. Good evening, here. Good evening, John. Um, okay. This open meeting of the select board is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020. Due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate the transmission of the virus, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings and as such the governor's order suspends the requirements of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and are encouraged to participate remotely. The order which you can find posted with the agenda materials for this meeting allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so people can follow along with the deliberations. Um, we do ensure public participation as noted prior through the Zoom webinar functions. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that all attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that folks may be able to see you and to take care not to share the screen of your computer unless you choose to do so. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. All supporting materials that have been provided this body are on the town's website in our agenda packet unless otherwise noted. I will introduce each speaker on the agenda after they conclude their remarks. Um, people can raise their hands for questions or comments. Please remember to mute your phone or your computer when you're not speaking. Please remember to speak clearly to help generate accurate minutes. If you wish to engage in conversation between members, please um, go do so through the chair, taking care to identify yourself. And all of our votes um, will be taken via roll call. I don't believe that there are any changes to the posted agenda. Um, I already covered the first announcement and um, I also just wanted to note it is um, with it being our March 10th meeting that it has now been three years since the March 13th um, vandalism on the African meeting house and I thought it would be remiss to not mention, mention it since it had such a dramatic impact on our community. And to just um, mention to the public that the investigation is still open. And if anyone has any kind of information, please present it to the state police or to the district attorney's office. And um, I just thought it appropriate at almost our three year anniversary that, that we acknowledge the incident. Thank you, Don. Um, and we have a, we will move to our COVID-19 weekly update. And um, actually Jericho is going to lead our discussion on this this evening. Good afternoon slash evening, everyone. Um, so I think we're going to be moving to a bi-weekly um, update on a number of COVID things. So we'll be doing sort of, uh, Roberto will handle the um, direct COVID infection information and I will do a, an enforcement slash other thing update on alternating weeks. Um, I will get right into the enforcement numbers. Um, then I have uh, two points of other um, information. And then I'm sure that there are several questions that people have come up with um, 
uh, given the uh, recent developments in terms of uh, state and federal guidance. Uh, so we'll start with the enforcement numbers. Um, we have uh, 385 field inspections so far. We have visited 347 different job sites. We have 99 enforcement actions. We've shut down 16 uh, job sites. Uh, we have uh, 10 total citations uh, out of this. Our crude compliance rate, uh, which again is the number of enforcement actions overall versus the number of times we've interacted with the public, uh, is at 89%, which is a drop of 2% from last week. Um, and we have received 15 tips and 13 requests for clarification. Um, in general, I think as we move uh, in towards uh, landscaping uh, season and the beginning of the season, we're going to see a slight shift in how we do enforcement, um, but uh, hopefully um, we'll be following uh, with both the recommendations of the economic task force as well as the governor's um, statewide orders. And in terms of other COVID related news, um, I'm not going to be giving Roberto's uh, slideshow because I am uh, not uh, qualified to do so. Uh, but um, I have been following the BioBot results. Um, we're waiting on one order of BioBot for the viral loads in the sewage. Um, the most recent one that I have available indicates uh, five cases per day, and we've been showing less than that um, uh, from direct testing results. So there's a potential of there being some minor underreporting or people are just being more asymptomatic than normal and not getting tested at the same rates. Um, the other related news is the uh, town of Nantucket has uh, decided to participate in a, the smell test research program. Um, the, uh, the olfactory sense test um, being developed by MGB, we've entered in a partnership with that. There'll be more news on that as uh, we get into the season, but this is a pilot program um, for MGB to do research on that as well. Uh, and I believe that is pretty much everything in terms of my prepared notices. Any questions? Oh, sorry, please go ahead, Don. Uh, um, just, any questions? Right? I was just going to say, if there are any questions, please raise your hand. Board members, public. Christy? Thank you. Um, First, I just want to say a great job on COVID vaccinations. Um, both my parents received their first dose, so it's a very exciting feeling, and I'm sure many others are feeling very grateful for the town for that. Um, second, I've heard of other towns having a kind of call list for if there's any cancellations that day, and I was wondering if we have something similar set up here. Uh, we do, but it's an internally generated uh, list. As of right now, there is no mechanism to add yourself to that list. Um, as we start getting larger volumes of, of vaccine going through, I imagine that may change. Um, but as of right now, uh, the vaccine planning group, the NCH and the town determines the people who are on that list uh, ahead of time. Thank you, though. Thank you. Um, Jericho, have we received any of the um, single dose Johnson & Johnson? Doses? We have. Uh, at this point, no. Um, the Johnson & Johnson is having trouble scaling up manufacture of the Janssen virus. Um, so the numbers of dosages coming to Massachusetts, never mind Nantucket, are still rather small. Um, I would anticipate seeing an increased supply of the um, Janssen vaccine probably at the end of April. Um, I, from what I've read about their manufacturing process, they should be fully to scale at that point. Um, the uh, It's a, a much more convenient and uh, easier to schedule and plan vaccine. Um, and it still has the, it is still an extreme, it's still completely effective to prevent hospitalizations. But given the slightly higher efficacy rates of Moderna and Pfizer, um, I think when possible, using those is better, um, just in terms of, you know, the completeness of protection. However, the Janssen vaccine is extreme, is, is, incredibly useful from a planning and logistics point of view. Um, so there's a role for both of them. Although at the moment we have plans, uh, our, the allotments will be remaining Pfizer and Moderna. Any other questions? Okay, um, do we no, have- John, any... it's Matt. Oh, yeah, Matt, sorry. Yeah, I had my first shot uh, last Thursday and it was incredible how organized they were. Uh, I'm a big baby. I don't like needles and I didn't even feel it. It was, they did a, an amazing job. 
yeah, the, the staff and uh, and and planning at the VFW hospital is is just really impressive. Christy, thank you. I I just feel like I have to make a, a comment that we're basically coming up on the one year anniversary of COVID outbreak in our last in person meeting, and I just think the town has just done and the hospital done such a great job, you know, getting us through you know, what was a very scary time to kind of a hopeful time of having a vaccine and that distribution has gone very well. And we've been able to help businesses through a grant program. So just a kudos to the town and, and the hospital for getting us through this past year. Now, I believe we're nearing about 10% of the island's population having received first doses. Um, and I know that number is going to increase greatly when the next step of the vaccination program opens. That's the occupational categories, uh, everything from retail onward. Um, we're likely not going to get too much head uh, early notice on that, but it should be coming up in the next few weeks. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm greatly looking forward to watching that number of uh, vaccinated Nantucketers go significantly higher. Any other questions for Jericho? Yeah, I've got one, Don. Melissa? Yeah, um, hey Jericho. When you say 10% of the island population, what number are you using for that? Um, so that is actually a fantastic question. Um, we were basing that off of that week's um, sewer flow. So we were using sort of the extrapolated 55 uh, gallon per person calculation that the state of Massachusetts reply, uh, relies on. Um, using that number as of this, pre, uh, sorry, as of last Monday, we were at uh, just under uh, 10%. Um, I haven't seen the biobots this week, so we're still floating somewhere between 9 and 11, depending upon the, the instantaneous population of the island. Okay, and just a, a comment, I'm not sure if other board members have received um, similar emails and concern from constituents, but just, you know, that um, those numbers, the population numbers we're using, whether it's Biobot or the census, how accurate they are. And um, if you could just remind us, Jericho, because your statement of that reminded me to ask the question, um, when we're being, when vaccine doses are being distributed, as our population starts to go up over these next two to three months, and then you know, through the summer season, are, how are we going to manage getting adequate supply to vaccinate our seasonal employees? That's actually a, a very good question. Um, the state's allocation process depends on a couple of different factors, and only one of those factors is population. Um, basically, it looks at the capacity of your vaccination process. So how many people can you get vaccinated within a given point of time? Um, and as long as you use up 85% of the allotment that you receive within 10 days, um, then you keep getting the, the that's how they, they tag their uh, allocation process. Um, at the moment, we're not running, uh, I think we're running at something like 75% of theoretical capacity just for the current vaccination process. And there are several tricks that the, uh, the staff, um, the clinical staff at the um, hospital has come up with to potentially increase that even significantly higher. Um, so, uh, you know, the limiting factor in all of this remains vaccine availability. So right now we're taking basically whatever we can get. Um, as the vaccine availability increases, then because we're able to store the uh, Pfizer vaccine for long periods of time, because we have a very efficient and effective system, the state, when they have more vaccine, should be allocating larger amounts of it. Um, additionally, as we move closer to the summer, there are going to be more ways for you to get a vaccine. Um, we're currently in phase two of the, the three phases that everyone's incredibly sick of hearing about. But by phase three, it's supposed to be general availability. So you would be able to source it um, in the same way that you're able to source any other vaccine that, you're that's, that you need for travel, et cetera, et cetera. So there should be significantly more methods to receive it, um, as well as a greater supply of it being distributed through the state. Um, right. My concern in terms of um, vaccinating seasonal workers, et cetera, et cetera, is more on an outreach and communications point of view, not on a capacity point of view and not on a vaccine availability one. Okay, great. And when you say alternative methods, Don, I'm sorry, may I, may I follow up? Um, when you say you know, alternative methods, are you speaking about pharmacies, doctor's offices? I, I'm not sure we have as many sort of methods or options as other folks may off island, but it would be our hope that our, our pharmacies would be able to contribute to getting shots in arms? 
So one of the major limitations for pharmacy distribution is the necessity of the observation period afterwards. Um, and so we're somewhat constrained there. But once the, and again, anytime you look ahead on the vaccine availability system, it's it, very difficult to give any sort of precise answer. But general availability on this one might be that you would be referred to um, referred, you would receive one from your primary care physician uh, through hospital clinics, through participating pharmacies, through, um, you know, other healthcare providers such as dentists, et cetera, et cetera. So there are plenty of methods that there that, that should be available once vaccine availability crosses a certain threshold. Great. And then one last one, I think um, there have been some comments and concerns about the equitable distribution of vaccinations. And, and I, I, I think you're um, alluding to that in your comment about outreach and communication. So um, what ways can we help or can our Council for Human Services help with that outreach? Are you having those conversations now to prepare for that? Very much so. Um, I've been uh, been concerned, not concerned is the wrong, wrong word, but I've been trying to develop um, sort of an array of different enrollment processes, communications processes, um, and we'll be meeting with the state's uh, contact tracing collective to kind of pick their brain on a variety of different outreach techniques. Um, we're doing what we can to make sure that we have linguistic, linguistically nimble communications. Um, we're going to be trying to, um, you know, participate and interact with the island's faith community as well as other nonprofits. Um, we have several nonprofit and um, human services related organizations right now um, doing translations, doing local outreach, doing community organization and outreach as well. So um, we're, it can always be better, but we are very aware of the concern and we are very serious about making sure we make an effort on that. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Don. Any other questions? Do we have an economic task force update? Yes, we do. Um, so the economic task force meets every Wednesday and today we held a public forum um, where we had some public input from people who attended and um, I'm sure we'll have more of those in the future as we get closer to the summer season. So stay tuned. Um, we really just reviewed kind of what the task force has been up to, which I've been updating uh, the board here every Wednesday. Um, we had a few questions um, from INS trying to determine how to deal with breakfast um, and food this upcoming season. So we're going to be looking for some input um, from the health department on that. And I'm sure Amy might be covering this in the next agenda item, but Governor Baker had some new updates this week about the vaccination and traveling. So we were going over that. Um, one of the biggest questions that came up is how do we kind of notify second homeowners and visitors of how to safely visit Nantucket this season? So, you know, if they're coming from a place like Texas that no longer has a mask mandate, we want to make sure that they know they have to wear a mask here. Um, so Florencia is working on a QR code in which uh, restaurants and retail and other businesses will be able to pull up um, a kind of like how Nantucket's reopening site and see all the current guidelines um, and COVID restrictions. And so we're going to be working on figuring out ways to distribute that. So it's, um, you know, real estate offices and so forth and inns and everybody can get that to visitors before th this season. Um, so as always, if there's any questions, you can email actaskforce at nantucketchamber.org. And our grant applications are still open for the rock solid fund. Um, so we're very excited to see how we can help businesses. That's it. Thank you. Any questions? Okay. Um, Amy, do you have an update for us? Yes. Um, just briefly, I'll touch on uh, what Christy brought up. There was a change in the travel guide for traveling out of state and coming back into Massachusetts. And that was just uh, relieving those that are fully vaccinated from having to file the travel form or be tested prior to coming back to Massachusetts and being fully vaccinated is um, at least two weeks after your last shot. So I think that was that one update. Um, and also to touch on the QR code, um, I asked for it, Florencia got it to me in about two minutes. So we have that and we'll be distributing it so folks can know whatever the current regulation is in place. 
The only thing I'll touch on tonight, I'm gonna to circle back to that new update in gatherings that will take effect on March 22nd. It's caused a lot of questions and confusion because of just the unique um, aspect of events and weddings on Nantucket. Just quickly, it's the gatherings limit effective on March the 22nd, subject to public health data. Gatherings limit will increase for event venues and public settings, but will stay the same in private settings, such as private residence. So event venues, meaning licensed facilities and public settings, um, 100 indoor and 150 outdoor subject to uh, sector protocols. In private settings, such as private residences, it's listed as 10 indoors, 25 outdoors. So that rubs up against a lot of weddings and events that may take place on private property. So we are reviewing how that works here. You know, there's zoning things to think about, legal implications and things of that sort. So we're just going through and reviewing that. I've set up a meeting with the hospitality industry, a lot of event planners and all the businesses that support those events and weddings on Tuesday. Um, at 11 a.m. and I'm going to tell them whatever I know at that time to help go over questions. So anyone out there that did not receive that today can certainly reach out um, and we will send you that link. So all I just wanted to say to everyone is we're working on it. We're not looking to adjust it or change it, just how does it work um, legally interpret it um, with Nantucket circumstances. So we will make sure we communicate to that as soon as we know. Jason? Thank you, Madam Chair. Amy, what 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 is the qualifier for event space? Yeah, and and therein lies <laughs> the question. Um, we you know have gone through. We've had several interpretations. If you talk about a lease or things of of that sort, a lot of properties, of course, have a lease specifically for an event or for a wedding or things of that sort. But as you know, this has been something depending on the property that's gone on for years. There's questions of zoning. Um, things of that sort. And we're also dealing with a temporary situation and how does that work? So I've reached out for some legal review and advice to make sure um, I'm not missing anything and for zoning and plus to review and, and just so we understand it um, from all aspects um, because yeah, it's, it's a little complicated. So the intent was to make sure that a lot of these larger events are held based on sector protocols that have higher standards of health standards and things of that sort. So it makes sense, but we just have to learn how it works for Nantucket. So I'm in the process of doing that. Thank you. That'll be interesting. I assumed it was just, it was commercial, a commercial building, but then what if a nonprofit owns a big field and can they, yeah, it gets tricky. It does. There's a lot of if, ands, this, buts. So as usual, Nantucket, it's just unique. So we're just, we're, again, we're not creating something or we're just trying to make sure we fully understand. Melissa? Thanks so much. Um, Amy, I've heard from a couple of restaurateurs, um, you know, some support for the um, continuation of outdoor dining, but um, just passing along some continued concern for what I, th I think we're all bracing ourselves to be an exceptionally busy season this year. Increased um, capacity for some restaurants, you know, may be happening by the time July hits um, and how we're going to be able to deal with enforcement um, certainly having strong police presence in town last year was really helpful to the businesses. So I don't know um, if you have a comment or any thoughts on that tonight, but just to pass along those comments that, you know, I think there's excitement and concern and, and also it's been shared that there's, you know, in se several different conversations that, you know, some restaurants lost, you know, anywhere between 25 and 35% of their business last year. And even if they had limited capacity, they're going to try to make that up, that deficit up in volume this year, um, which is going to just create a lot of activity and traffic um, in town, both pedestrian traffic and vehicular traffic. So um, what, what, what do you think when I say that? <laughs> No, it's, it's, it's timely. Um, I started my Zoom tour today with some restaurants. We started with the downtown folks that are doing outdoor dining and things. We had a, had a meeting and I'm going to continue that every Wednesday so that we, we hit every, every question. And that came up. 
certainly. And the, the, just quickly, the law or the rule is with this whole temporary situation of outdoor expansion is no one's occupancy is to change. If your occupancy is 100 um, and it's all indoors now and you expand out onto the street, it's still 100. So if you are able to fit 50 inside with the spacing, you can only put 50 outside with the spacing. You can't all of a sudden have 150 on this program. That would have to be something completely separate. So the expansion is, is only to give them more room to have their occupancy safely. Um, so we've dealt with that. We're, we're, we're dealing with all the different issues of you know, staff parking, getting them down there, all those certain issues with parking and things of that sort. So um, all of what you said was brought up and we're working through solutions so that when I present it to you, we've kind of tackled some of that. And I think as we called it, we're going to edit some spaces from last year based on some of these um, comments and such. So we're all trying to work together to come up with that plan. Any other questions tonight? Okay, no public hands raised. I don't think, I think that concludes our COVID update for this evening then. Um, we will move on to public comment for any items that are not otherwise on our agenda. This is a time when someone can bring something to our attention to potentially get put on a future agenda or to get back to them with more information. I don't see any hands. If something comes up, feel free to raise your hand. Um, no new business that I'm aware of. We will move on to approval of the minutes, payroll and treasury warrants. Can we take those all as one motion? Unless there's a motion to approve all three. Second. All those in favor by roll call, Jason Bridges. Aye. Melissa Murphy. Aye. Christy Farantella. Aye. Matt Fee. Aye. John Holgate, aye. That carries unanimously. Um, citizen departmental requests. We have a request for approval to submit a local action unit application for 31 Fairgrounds Road. Um, Tucker is here, but does anyone have any questions on this? Do, or could we just, Christy? Uh, just a clarification question for Tucker. Um, I know this is 22 units going towards Safe Harbor, and can you just explain to the board where the other units um, will be coming from? Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much for that question, Christy. Um, so in addition to the 22 units that will be submitted under this local action un unit application, simultaneously Habitat for Humanity is submitting under the local initiative program uh, at the end of this week as well to add three units that they have planned at Benjamin Drive. So that would be 25 total going through at the same time. Thank you. Does anyone want to make a motion? Motion to approve. Second. All those in favor by roll call, Jason Bridges. Aye. Melissa Murphy. Aye. Christy Farantella. Aye. Matt Fee. Aye. Don Holgate, aye. That motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Tucker. Um, we have a public hearing this evening. This is uh, to review the, um, the sewer articles. There are recommendations in your packet. Um, David Gray is with us. I will open the public hearing. Um, I'm wondering if David stepped away for a moment. Oh, there he is. Hi, David. Hello, everyone. Do you want to um, take take us through the recommendations? I know that there's a rating system, and some some are different than others. I can. Yep. We'll uh, we'll start with Article 83. Um, it's to add um, multiple lots on Evergreen from number 2A up to number 44 Monahanneset. Um, we have reviewed all of these uh, lots based off the 20, 2004 and 2014 CWMP. And they were in those original calculations. I don't know why they were never put in originally, but um, they have now come forward to try to get this whole group added in. They are adjacent to a sewer district. Um, they are adjacent to some sewer lines that have been put in in, the, in previous times. Um, so this one did 
receive a, a positive recommendation from the group to uh, add these parcels into the district. Uh, this one also includes just a note, um, number 18 Evergreen, which actually is Article 84. They had a separate one, uh, but because this group is, exceeds five, it scored a higher rating than a single lot. So um, the next article, which is 84, which was specifically for just number um, 18, we um, did not give that one a positive because it was within this group that did score the actual nine um, points. Um, I can go through the checklist, Don, if you want directly on each one or if there's just questions on the checklist. Uh, I don't know that you need to go through it on each one. I, um, oh, em Emily Molden does have a question. Um, I'll go to Emily and then um, Matt and Jason both raise their hands. Thank you, Don. Emily Molden here for the Nantucket Land Council. Um, can you hear me okay? Um, can you speak up a little bit? It's very faint. I'm sorry, it might be a, a problem with my computer. Are you able to hear me? Um, I can hear you, but you might need to yell a little bit. Okay, I'll do my best. Um, so I did have a couple of general questions, uh, but then I also had one specific to this article. So I guess um, just maybe the general questions I'll put out there first and maybe they can be addressed and then I'll just uh, finish with my question about this article. I noticed that in some of the checklists, there were comments that were made or in the recommendations that looked a little bit more closely or, or commented on the potential implications for development on the lots or build out, but not all of them. And this one uh, in particular, this first one, I didn't see any comments about the potential subdividability or uh, additional structures on the lots or bedrooms that would result. Uh, but I did see that for some of the articles. So I just was interested in some clarification as to why those points were made on for some properties and, and not on this one. Um, my other, my general question had to do with the checklist and maybe this is just something that David can clarify. Under the uh, part of the checklist for sewer systems, there's a question about whether the proposed extension will serve at least five properties. And I noticed that that was checked yes for all of them, including just the individual property requests. So I was just looking for some clarification on whether that implies that extending the sewer line to that one property will enable multiple others to also tie in. I just was a little unclear as to why um, it says even for the individual properties that it will exceed, it will be five or more properties that, that could tie in as a result of the extension. Um, and then my final question for now, just on this one, I noticed that um, while all the others are clearly citizen petitions, uh, this one is uh, included as a petition for the Board of Sewer Commissioners from you guys. So I just kind of wanted to get a better understanding of how that process worked. It kind of sounds from David's presentation that maybe this should have been put forward as a citizen's petition. And I, I didn't know what the distinction was, why this was being prioritized by the Board of Sewer Commissioners. I know that it sounds like it was initially um, included in the calculations, but I, it was not highlighted in the 2020 update as a priority area. So I would be interested in a little more history as to why this one has come forward now. Thank you. The, um, I'll start with the, uh, I have noticed that on some of the checklists, it seems like some of the um, both yes and no were checked on some of them. Don't know if that's just a computer glitch or whatever. Um, on this one, uh, this one does specifically this article itself, um, which was 83, um, did take in, exceed the five lots. Um, and the reason that we brought this forward is the, um, the planning and everyone else's the town article is that there was going to be seven or, or nine or 11 different articles that would have been separate for each and every property that wanted to get in. Um, we discussed it um, amongst our, our group 
and it seemed to make more sense to, to bring them all in as one article um, instead of having to have you know, nine, nine, seven, eight, nine uh, different warrant articles all for the same area. Um, the 2020 update um, did not look at this specific area because it was within the calculations for the flows uh, when they did the update in 2014, the flows that were calculated for the treatment facility. Um, the 2020 master plan looked at a lot of the areas that were outside of that original 2004, 2014, um, the CWMPs, both of them. Um, there's some comments on one in Sconset, which there was not a true CWMP in Sconset originally. There was one currently underway um, for Sconset. Um, some of those properties were added out there before my, my time. Um, and a recent town meeting, I don't know, four or five years ago, I guess it was. Um, but I hope that um, it's not that we reprioritize anything. It's that these lots and in discussions we said with our group, these have been looked at for a few years. And finally, when everyone started to come forward, um, the town took it under their, uh, their, their, their means to bring them all together in one. I don't know if that helps answer that one uh, at all, Emily. Um, I'm trying to think with the other, yes, you said the other checks. The other one, the other question I believe you asked was one of the other sewer system, yes, questions was, um, does this sewer extension have potential for future extension of the sewer collect connection, collection system? Um, only within that, those specific lots, um, the way the uh, sewer works is if there's a sewer line that passes in front of your property, then you're subject to having to tie in. Um, the future needs, er, not future uh, non-needs areas, uh, such as Monahannis or whatever like that, would not be able to tie into these lines because these do not tie into um, Airport Road, Monahannis. These are all going back down into Daffodil. Um, so it would take in, it, it gives potential expansion for the, the specific lots within this article, not necessarily specific expansion for um, much further down the road, if that makes sense. I don't know if I got all of your questions. Emily, Madam Chair, could I just follow up with yeah. one? Thank you. Um, so yes, David, thank you. I think that that is helpful. Um, and I can, I can raise, um, one of those again with um, a later article that you'll be able to help me out with. Uh, just for this one, I think the only other question I really had, it, it seems as though for some of the other articles, there was an accounting for the potential uh, subdivision or build out of the particular lots that were being considered. And I didn't see that here. And I think it's certainly appropriate for the board to take that into consideration or look at that, but I didn't really see that analysis for this one. Thank you. Thank you. I believe that that was because of the way the zoning was um, explained during our meetings with Andrew and uh, Roberto. Uh, this these certain parcels didn't have the ability to, I, I, I don't know if these were country, I can't remember what the exact zoning was on these lots, um, but they weren't um, able to subdivide um, most of their properties. And those, in the 2014 CWMP, they calculated all the flows based on the existing um, zoning as it was at that time, which, don't know off the top of my head if that had changed since then, but um, I yeah, hope that helps answer some of that. Matt? Matt, you're muted. There we go. Thank you, David. 
who fills in the checklist? Do you do it as a group when you sit around the table or does, is it the same person that does it every time? We do it as a group. Um, this time we couldn't meet in person. So a lot of it was done by phone call back and forth um, between the three of us. Um, and uh, so it's not done by just, I usually end up doing the typing and filling out. So all the typos are my fault most of the time, but uh, we do it as a group. And that, that's great. I think Emily has a great suggestion to talk about, you know, sort of uh, buildability and, and, su and subdivision, dividability. Uh, you know, I think, so I think that's important. Uh, and then the other question I'm going back to, cause I still don't quite get it. it. Emily's question about five, you know, five or more, is that five or more included in the article that's coming forward? Or is that five or more that might be in the sewer once the pipe goes by? You know, how, what do you determine five, the number five on? The, um, the number of properties which would be served by this extension. Um, this extension actually comes from daffodil, goes down to number one evergreen. And then the other part of that extension goes the other direction towards evergreen. So it's if it passes by five parcels. Okay, great. Yeah, no, perfect. That that gets it. And, it, and as we all know, there's there's a issue of sort of equity and how do we do this when somebody further down adds sewer to their expense and they make a lot of money and then everybody that can't may not be able to pay is asked to, to tie in and we're working on that. So that's something for us to keep in mind. I don't think that's an issue here necessarily. Maybe it is, but I think that's something we are grappling with a bit. Yes, and we are working on that from our other meetings that we have had at the select board, yes. Yeah, so it's just something to think about. And I will. the other thing I will say, you guys have come a, a long way on your form and on the presentation. I agree, you know, with all of your, uh, you know, all you know that the first 83 and 84, I agree, should be included and the rest should have a two thirds vote. I agree with all the recommendations and, you know, it is getting clearer every year, so you know, your group deserves some credit for, you know, sort of getting your arms around it. Thank you very much. Jason? Uh, Matt stole, stole uh, McGlory there. At the, that's what I was going to say. When I first got on the board, I think this process was just starting, David, of defining this checklist and it was getting better. And, and I just want to remind, uh, or Libby, you can walk us through for maybe some of those who don't know, if we support this, it's a 50%. Um, passing at town meeting versus two thirds, just as a reminder to everyone. So if, even if we don't, um, if we went against something that had a nine for whatever reason, the voters still can pass it at two thirds vote. Is that, is that right, Libby or David? Yes, if the board votes to approve these, it's a majority vote at town meeting. If you were vote to vote to disapprove, it would be two thirds, yeah. Matt? Yeah, and the rationale for this, you know, go, way, going way back, there was a push at the time to, oh, sewer the whole island. This would be great. Everything should be sewered. But when you actually ran the numbers and looked at the expense, there was a lot of areas that it makes zero sense to do that in. It wasn't necessary. It's also to protect the investment in the sewer plant. It's very expensive to build a new larger plant, to upgrade, as we've all seen those expenses. So, uh, you know, at the time, you know, the only fair way to do it was what was in was in, what was out was left out. And the things that in, were in needs areas and had to be uh, added over time have been added or should be added, have been added. And there, and there were, we want to have a high bar from areas that, for areas going in that don't have to be added, that aren't really a necessity. It's more of a benefit to, you know, benefit to the homeowner potentially, but it's, it's not necessarily a necessity because of the costs. And so I think, uh, you know, and, and if you also look some of these, you know, at some point you have to draw a line. If we just said, geez, if you're next to the, someone that has sewer, you, you can get it. Well, you follow that. Eventually everyone has it. And, and we're back in, a, in 10 or 15 years wondering how to build a new sewer or pay for it. So, you know, so I think that uh, you know, that was the reason for the two thirds vote is to make it difficult, not, you know, not make it uh, easy. 
Um, I don't know that we have to go through these one by one. I mean, I I agree as well that um, that the recommendations are solid and that we should go with the recommendations. Um, how does the board feel about that? I mean, we'll see if there are any more public comments. But you, does anyone have specific questions on any of the recommendations? Okay, Jason. But we would just anything that's nine or above. We would just in the motion we would say, we recommend you know we approve these. Dot dot dot. That's that's what I was thinking. Um, but it is a public hearing, Matt. Well, I'll, I'll wait till you ask the public if they have a comment, and then I'll. Okay. Um, it's a, it, this is a public hearing. Is there anyone else? Oh, em Emily has her hand up again. Emily, can you hear me? Yes, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. And uh, just to echo, also, I appreciate, uh, David, the presentation. It makes it um, really helpful going through these to have all that information there. Um, I think the, the final question that I would just ask before you all go to a vote on the recommendations is for Article 88, which is one Morgan Square. And that's just because uh, when I took a look, it looks as though that one only received seven points out of the nine, but had a positive recommendation. So I'm interested in how the board will um, approach that one. Thank you. Um, David, do you want to touch on that? I can, yes. Um, the Morgan Square one, um, which is actually um, listed in the 2020 update. It's actually within my comments needs area. Um, so that takes it, that, give, that gives us the uh, extra push, so to speak, to take in, uh, not so much as an automatic, like Matt said, is that's why we had the needs areas determined in the 2014 and 2004 uh, update. But as we have found um, going forward with different um, evaluations that we've had and um, updates with like the sewer master plan. Um, these areas were, and then, and then one, one Morgan Square was just added last year to the sewer district. Um, I think it was last year's meeting. It was, it was very recently. Um, and um, they went through the same checklist. Um, and as you can see, they are um, very close to a, a wetland area. Um, and that this would basically be the end of the line, except for the other property on the other side of the pond, which would will most likely become served from, um, if we go with the gravity line down South, Shore, down South Shore Road, those other parcels on that other side would be cut with that. But this is in a um, one of the listed needs areas. That's what gave it the extra push over um, for a recommendation to be put into the sewer district. Emily, did that answer your question? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. It did. I was just a little unsure uh, because it states that it, there has to be nine points for positive recommendation, but that clarifies. Thank you. I mean, I was that's that's a decision point for the board at this stage too. Is with it not having a nine point rating, um, do we want it to get bumped to town meeting for a two thirds vote? Matt. Yeah, that, that would be my recommendation uh, on that on that specific property. That was the area that we had issues with. The pipe went by a bunch of, you know, once by a bunch of people that are going to struggle to be added. And so I think we should be careful uh, there. You know, uh, the other the other thing, and it's, it's just a general comment. There's an assumption sometimes that that any sewer is good, that if we add sewer along the pond, we're going to save the pond. It's wonderful. The reality is, I don't think any of us know if that's the case because we no one has really studied. I remind Emily this all the time. Nobody has studied, uh, you know, what is the impact of the hardscaping, the increase of ground cover, you know, the additional homes, uh, it, the additional vehicles that are there. No one has really studied what the impact on the on the pond is and or on the on the water body, the harbor is when we do this. And so it may be that it's, you know, it might be really positive and a great thing. It also could be that it's neutral or it could be negative. And so I don't think we really know. So the, 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 the claim that any sewer in those areas is positive has yet to be 100% proven. And so I think we need to be uh, careful with that. 
but you know my my motion would be uh to to say yes to 83 and 84 and have those be majority vote and have 85 to 89 be uh two-thirds vote and can i, I hold that until i close the public hearing yep that's fine but and i and i, I believe one with. morgan i think one morgan square went through the same thing i believe they went to the two-thirds vote at town meeting i believe yeah, I, I I was heading with if they didn't score a nine, same same as Matt that we should that those should require a two thirds vote, and then the recommendation will be to approve it. But we need to get that that consensus from town meeting. Um, if there's no further public comments, I'm going to close the public hearing, and then I will move to a motion. Matt, if you wouldn't mind just restating your motion quickly. Motion is to. Uh support 83 and 84 for a 50, you know, majority vote and the remainder 85 through 89 as a two thirds vote. Is there a second? second? All those in favor by roll call, Jason Bridges. Aye. Melissa Murphy. Aye. Christy Ferrantella. Aye. Matt Fee. Aye. John Holgate, aye, that carries unanimously. Um, next, we will move on to the town manager's report. This is um, traffic safety recommendations. Thank you, Don. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. Um, so I, just a quick introduction. Um, it's a policy of the board that traffic safety committee recommendations that will result in the loss of parking spots go to you for final determination as well as things like stop signs. And if the board is in agreement with the stop sign recommendation that will ultimately require a public hearing. Um, Art Gasparo is on. He is the representative of the Traffic Safety Work Group and I think Art you're going to take them through. Sure I'd be happy to uh, for you Madam Chair. Would you uh, like me to proceed? Yes please Art. Sorry. That's okay. I got up uh, here for a second. The um, uh, there's a memorandum in your packet that outlines the um, four recommendations that the work group made to the town manager and ultimately to um, uh, come before the board. The first is to extend uh, a yellow line adjacent to the land bank codfish park playground. There's an area where uh, the entrance to um, the playground is and when folks park right in that spot it's difficult to see people coming out of the entrance into the road. So this was a request by the land bank um, and was uh, voted unanimously to support by the work group that there be a yellow line added there so that you can't have parking immediately adjacent to that um, uh, pedestrian entrance. Would you like to me to do, do you like to do these one at a time, Madam Chair? Uh -huh. or? I think we should probably do them one at a time, if that's if that's okay. Yep. Agreed. Just see if anybody from the public wants to comment on any of them. Jason? Yeah, can I, I think sometimes we forget. Art, can you go over who's on the traffic safety work group? Just so we know uh, sure. like, who's looking at all these. Sure. So I'm the chair. Uh, Ms. Jack Gardner is the vice chair. Uh, Chief uh, Police Chief Pittman is on there. Uh, Fire Chief Murphy. Uh, DPW Director McNeil. Um, uh, Mickey Rowland is on there representing also um, the Commission on Disability, I believe, as well as, a, uh, as an appointee. Um, um, Erica Mooney serves as our liaison and, and staff support. Thank you. I think it's important to know it's a lot of different views and experiences looking at these before it comes to us. Thanks. Thanks, Jason. Um, does anyone have any questions or concerns with, with A? Could we make a motion? Motion to approve. Second. Uh, there's a public hand. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, Br Bruce Mandel, do you have a comment on part A? Or are you on for part B, I'm, I'm thinking? I guess I'm on for part B, I apologize. Okay, I'll come back to you in just a second after I take the vote on A. Um, Jason Bridges? Aye. Melissa Murphy? Aye. Christy Ferrantella? Aye. Matt Fee? Aye. John Holgate? Aye. That carries unanimously. Um, I'm Bruce, before I go to you, I'm going to have Art introduce B. 
Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. So the second one was a citizen request, which was brought before the um, uh, work group and um, related to the parking situation on the dirt road, uh, Macy's Road, which is um, the dirt road that runs sort of behind Millie's and comes from the, um, uh, the beach parking lot at, uh, in Mattaquet by Chicago Street. And so there you have a photo of, um, you know, sort of the regular type condition that's happening there. And there was some concern mostly related to emergency vehicle access uh, through that area. There was also part of the residents' concern were, were their ability to get in and out of their driveways. The, um, the work group recommended that the side of the road with the driveways be designated as, as no parking shown on the graphic uh, as the red line and that you maintain the parking along the, um, I guess it would be the northwest side of the road. Um, everyone is sensitive, of course, to the need for parking in the area, but I think the overwhelming concern from a, um, traffic safety and really emergency vehicle access is being able to, to get through there. I am aware of some correspondence that was just submitted today, and I know that um, based on the last comment, Mr. Mandel, I was like to follow up on that. I don't disagree that there could be uh, additional work in the area that you know might allow for more parking in the area, you know, along the road if the town wanted to get into that. But under current conditions, unless there's sort of a um, a further initiative and directive, I would think from the board for, um, you know, changes in that area, then until such time that happens from a safety perspective, I think that the recommendation of the work group should be implemented. And then maybe there's a phase two if the board were so inclined. Thank you, Art. Um, Bruce, I'll go to you. And then we have another hand raised. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my email was written a little bit prematurely. Uh, I agree with Art. Um, if you don't mind, <clears throat> could you please post the photo again? <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, this photo was taken from approximately the intersection of Macy and Chicago looking up toward Baltimore. And as you can see, the vehicles on the right are parked along the area that is being addressed by this proposal. And uh, it certainly makes sense to not have parking on both of these sides of Macy in the condition that Macy is in. Uh, even if those vehicles on the right were not there, <clears throat> the widest fire truck is almost 10 feet wide. Uh, it would still struggle to go down there uh, and my email was meant to uh, put on the record, perhaps as a suggestion, as Mr. Gasparro just mentioned, that on the left side, uh, there needs to be some work done to move those uh, available parking spaces on the left further to the left. And that would need to be done. Uh, I assume that uh, Macy Road is still a private road. The town owns the property on the left, so it's kind of responsible for the roadway up to the middle of the road. Uh, and what I'm trying to imply by my lengthy, unfortunate email is that uh, it's important to maintain that parking. That was the purpose that the town made the exchange with the Madigan Land Trust, was to enhance the parking at the beach area and to help us move some of the employee parking that Millie's uses along Madigan Road, where the cars or vehicles are parked partially on Madigan Road, partially on the shoulder, creating a uh, traffic disturbance. And to allow the employees to continue to park further up Macy on the area closest to Millie's. So um, I appreciate Mr. Gasparro's suggestion that perhaps we could visit that particular concern at a future time and I would appreciate, um, Mr. Gasparro, if at the time your work group does uh, schedule to discuss that, if somehow uh, I could participate or some of the other folks out there can participate. Um, this is a very important area during the summer when there's a lot of traffic there. 
and it can get congested. So I appreciate this. And I didn't mean to imply that we shouldn't uh, go forward with that no parking area, but I don't think that its effectiveness will be fully achieved until we accomplish some other steps. Thank you. Thank you, um, Steve Atlas. I'm sorry, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, and I appreciate somebody from your office followed up to make sure that I knew about this. Um, yeah, it's getting very tough there, especially around sunset. Also, the dunes have blown over now into Macy, so cars are getting more and more stuck. So it's just sort of a free-for-all blocking driveways and garages, especially at night on that side of the street. Thank you. Max Brown. Oh, I was on mute. Uh, good evening, everybody, and thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to just comment real quick and introduce myself. I live over on Washington Avenue. I want to first thank Art and his team for the work that they've done and been doing. And I also want to support this proposition and proposal. I think uh, Bruce made all the great sort of points about in the immediate term, it would make some sense to, uh, to move those cars from the south side. And then I think in the more medium, longer term, look at expansion on the north side of Macy Lane as, as Art alluded to. So again, thank you for the time and appreciate the collaborative approach to this. Thank you. Um, I don't see any more public hands. Are there any um, board questions or comments? Matt? No, I, you know, I agree with the recommendation. Uh, if we look at the Northwest side, Perhaps that can be angle parking and get a fair amount of parking in there. I do think it's needed. Uh, I had one citizen contact me today worried about taking parking out. And uh, I sort of had to explain that if you add 100 houses and 200 plus cars at peak every year, the way things were a few years ago aren't the way things are now. And so, you know, we can't do the same things as we used to be able to do. We're putting more and more pressure everywhere. And you know, unfortunately, at some point, we're gonna to have to look at enforcement in these areas. Uh, you know, and we're gonna to have to find a way to not allow or to discourage all day parking. You know, I, so, I, but you know, I'm not suggesting that now, it was just a general comment I made because it, the person who reached out to me was, well, we didn't have to do that before. And I said, well, that was, you know, five, you know, it was, you know, three, 4,000 cars ago, you know, don't, it was so many cars ago, so many houses ago, you know, we have to do different things now. And it's sort of where we're, where we are, you know, where we're living. Uh, so I, you know, I, but I do support it. And I hope we look at how can we increase the parking on Northwest side. Anybody else? Happy to make a motion to approve this one. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor by roll call, Jason Bridges. Aye. Melissa Murphy. Aye. Christy Tarantella. Aye. Matt Faye. Aye. Don Holgate, aye. And I mean, I would love to see us look into further um, options for this area in terms of maybe widening the road a little bit to accommodate some additional parking. Um, Art, can you take us through C? Sure, and thank you for the vote on that. And as a follow-up, I will add that as an agenda item for future traffic safety. I have, I don't wanna go off the rails on something you just voted on. I've got a couple of ideas that just kind of came up as a result of this discussion and um, we'll report back. Um, item C, uh, as a result of a recommendation, there's been a lot of good work recently done by the Sconset Civic Association and they've been coming before um, the traffic safety work group and we're sort of trying to work through um, uh, the different uh, recommendations and there's some different levels that are gonna require some various discussion. But this one here um, was uh, supported by the work group in terms of um, you have, it's, it's fairly unusual to have a, well, let me back up and say the, the recommendation is to install a stop sign on Coffin Street at the intersection of West Sankey Road uh, so that the, you know, it's a T intersection right now and it would become a three-way stop instead of a two-way stop. 
and a two-way stop is fairly unconventional. I think that uh, most of you are probably familiar. This is if you're, um, instead of going into the village and you're heading over to New Street, back to Milestone, and you're coming through this way, uh, and folks tend to, you know, for lack of a better term, hang that left. Um, and this would better control that, um, the movements through that intersection, and we believe uh, improve the overall safety of the area. Um, are there any board questions or comments or any public questions or comments? I'm not seeing any. Is there a motion? Move approval. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor by roll call, Jason Bridges. Aye. Melissa Murphy. Oh, Aye. Erica. No, no, go on with your vote. I'll make a comment after. Christy Carantella. Aye. Matt Fee. Aye. John Holgate, aye. The motion carries unanimously. Um, does the installation of a new stop sign require a public hearing? So yes, we will schedule so. that. So we'll schedule that, yeah. Okay. okay. So we'll have to take this up again in a public hearing. Um, D. Um, so the final recommendation is related to um, a citizen request um, uh, made for a curb cut at 3 Westchester Street, which would result in the elimination of uh, a portion of an on-street parking space. We went through a couple of meetings on this. Uh, there's a, a well-prepared plan before you. Um, the, the original, the first hearing on it, there was only one space being created and it did not have the support of the work group and the applicant uh, and their surveyor went back to the drawing board and came up with uh, an on-site layout that creates two off-street parking spaces. So um, the um, procedure of the, the board in the past, uh, of the work group in the past has been that if um, you create more off-street parking than that, which is removed, then it could be seen as, a, as an overall benefit. Uh, essentially taking those those cars that would otherwise be on on the road uh, off the road so this is a situation where the work group after a second hearing and the change in the plan did agree to recommend um, to the board that there be uh, essentially an extension of an existing yellow line to allow for this driveway and the two off street parking spaces and i'm not sure if the applicant's representative is also here or not I don't see any hands. Um, board comments? Matt? Can we, can we do public comment and then come to us if there's any, are there any public comments? No, there's no hands raised. Right. Well, then, I, then I'll, I'll say what I always do when we get to this. Uh, I, have a, I, I don't like seeing, uh, I call them parking yards. Downtown is is turning into parking yards, and we've lost the gardens, and you know, and it's our fault. It's because we do have not uh, figured out how to do neighborhood parking and neighborhood stickers and demand management, and the pressure on these areas is uh, is has increased and is is pretty pretty tough. Uh, this area, I walk the dogs there fairly often, and. You know, you can't even walk that sidewalk uh, a lot of times. So, uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of work that really kind of needs to be done along Westchester. And, you know, and we really have to find a way so that neighbors can park in front of their houses again uh, and not have to turn all the yards into parking lots. Uh, so, you know, it's just, a, you know, I, I hope we get there someday. I hope we institute, you know, demand management parking and that we, you know, we consider the neighborhoods and that we don't have to, you know, sort of don't have to continue to see this happen in these historic areas. Jason? I'm okay with this because we reviewed it and said, we'd like to go back to the, if you're taking one, one away, like Art was saying, two is, is provided in addition. That's what they did. So I'm in favor. I can make a motion if there's. Go ahead. A motion to approve. Is there a second? 
Second. All those in favor by roll call. Jason Bridges. Aye. Melissa Murphy. Aye. Christy Farantella. Aye. Matt Fee. No. Don Holgate, aye. It carries as a four to one vote. Um, Art, thank you for being here tonight. Very appreciated. Cool. Bye. Thank you. Oh, Matt, go ahead. Mine, mine is a protest vote so that hopefully we get to the point where we don't have to see this happen continually. Noted. Um, select boards, reports, and comments. Um, tonight, we are going to have a discussion. This was brought up at the FinCom on Monday about sort of the alter alternate articles that are proposed this year in regard to housing at town meeting. Um, we, don't we don't need to take a position tonight. We just thought it would be good for the board um, of select, the select board, excuse me, to have a, um, a, um, a time to just have a little bit of discussion amongst ourselves since we had a fairly late agenda tonight. And um, Tucker is here. Libby, do you want to start us off? Sure, um, thank you. There's another proposal. Yes, thank you. So uh, Tucker and I and Brian um, all <laughs> spoke um, independent of each other this afternoon. Tucker, if it's okay with the board, is going to review um, sort of the current status of the town's subsidized housing inventory, as well as where we stand with state um, safe harbor with regard to 40B developments, if that's how I described it properly, Tucker, but you can fix it up if I didn't say that quite right. And then um, Brian and I would like to re review with you a, a kind of a proposal we have for the board's consideration to possibly make to the finance committee. But, uh, Tucker's got, um, I think, maybe something to display on screen. Go ahead, uh, Tucker. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Libby and Madam Chair, board members. Um, Eric, if we could put up the safe harbor document. Um, and I want to thank the um, uh, Finance Committee for a very thoughtful discussion on this earlier in the week. Um, so this is a document that was shared uh, at the start of that meeting as well, that just maybe helps um, summarize where we are at relative to our 490 unit 10% requirement from the state. Um, as folks are probably aware, you know, we are in a current period of safe harbor, which runs until this June 13th. Um, if you were to look at our official SHI list from the Department of Housing and Community Development, we would uh, it would show that there are 199 units or 4% toward that 10% total. Um, there actually are a few more units at this point which are eligible to be included mainly at the uh, Richmond project. Um, and those are accounted for along with some other projects that are in the works in terms of what we might reasonably, reasonably expect to come online as far as SHI eligibility goes in 2021. So you can see in the table um, that there are quite a few units actually that we expect to add this year. Um, the total being 166, a large portion of those would actually count toward safe harbor or what they officially call certification of our housing production plan. Um, because Nantucket has a housing production plan that is approved by DHCD, our requirement for safe harbor is actually cut in half to what it otherwise would be. So in our case, we need 24 units to get one year of safe harbor or 49 units for two years. Two years is the maximum which can be accumulated at any one point in time. So we anticipate uh, in 2021, uh, getting a new two-year period of safe harbor, effectively um, continuing uh, where we have been. And that would carry us, of course, to 2023. Um, so in the next uh, uh, in the next slide, we'll get into it a little bit more. But you can see here um, that it, we have 135, 137 Orange Street noted as well as uh, the UMass property in terms of our next two year period of safe harbor planning, um, which would carry us to 2025. And what's important to note on this slide about 2025, as you can see at the uh, top, 
the starting balance, that is the year where we would reach the um, 490 requirement and uh, effectively be at the 10% level. As folks know, the 10% requirement will get reset following last year's decennial census. We do not expect for the Department of Housing and Community Development to issue specifically what that new number is until about this time next year. So until then, we still operate under the 490 number. If we do go to the next slide, you can see, um, uh, again, there are several different uh, projects in the pipeline at present, which would extend our, uh, I, extend is the wrong word, which would create a new period of safe harbor um, uh, this year to mesh with our current period and carry us forward to where um, the 135, 137 Orange Street uh, project, as well as uh, forthcoming UMass project would then extend us through that 2025 timeline. The chart below the arrows indicate where the monies uh, either have been spent or are in the process of being spent with regard to the 25 million that was appropriated at annual town meeting in 2019. As the board is uh, aware, um, following those appropriations, the Affordable Housing Trust put together a group of excellent advisors in the form of the Neighborhood First Advisory Committee who came up with three um, principal strategies for the thoughtful and efficient deployment of these funds, respecting, of course, that these are generated by the taxpayer. So um, we're pleased that through the program developed really by that committee and the trust, um, we are able to extend um, what initially had been conceived to perhaps produce one year of safe harbor to produce um, two years plus lay the foundation for two more years. So um, we think we're on the right track here. Um, and as you can see, um, in relatively short order, we are going to have spent the, the vast majority of these funds, which is why um, we have uh, the forthcoming requests. So maybe Libby, this would be a good time to turn it over to you and Brian. Sure. So um, we've had, Brian and I have had some discussions and we've had some discussions with some others as well about this. We'd like to, to propose that the board consider a possible recommend, recommendation to the finance committee to think about or recommend that articles 23 and 38 get a no action motion and instead the motion to article eight, which is the general fund operating budget, include an appropriation of $2 million to the affordable housing trust. At the FinCom meeting on Monday, and there was a very thorough discussion um, about the housing articles, very extensive, it became apparent, and this is probably not the first time it's become apparent, the affordable housing trust needs a stable annual appropriation in order, for to, in order for it to do its work and further the goals of the town with respect to affordable housing. Um, we have some concerns about Article 38 as to flexibility with use of a stabilization fund, as well as that being a very large portion of the local room occupancy, the um, room occupancy tax revenue source. And it would, as written, necessitate significant budget cuts for the general fund budget. We also want to note that obviously affordable housing is extremely important. It's one of the most significant things that a lot of people are working on right now. There are though other big picture considerations that people like myself and the finance director need to take into consideration that are also going to require significant amounts of funding, including things like, I'm going to rattle off a little bit here, PFAS, solid waste long-term planning, stormwater, water quality, municipal facilities improvements, the island home, the senior center, coastal resiliency, sustainability, improvements to the Nantucket Regional Transit Authority service, sewer projects, roads, infrastructure, 
capital projects and maintenance, all of those things are going to require, as we know, a lot of money. And so we have to look at the big picture here. So we're happy to answer any questions about it, but we thought that this could be a potential good start in sort of operationalizing the and an ongoing appropriation for the affordable housing trust. Jason? And then Melissa, sorry, I'm not sure which one of you is first. I just have a clarification. Libby, did you say you're asking finance committee to not take no action on article 24 as well? You said 24 and 38. I'm sorry, I meant 23. If I said 24, I was mistaken. 23, okay. which is the 475,000, okay. which would basically be included in the 2 million. Okay, thank you. But to leave 24, which is a seven and a half million dollar override. Okay, thanks. Melissa. Uh, thank you very much, Don. Um, Libby, I'm really pleased to hear that you and Brian are coming forth with this recommendation for the select board. And I do think that it became very clear to anyone who was, um, who's been following this and who was watching the finance committee meeting um, on Monday um, that really it's our obligation as a community to start to fund our housing department um, and our housing initiatives through our operating budget. So I fully support this. I also want to um, thank um, Mr. Reed for bringing forth the idea of the stabilization fund. Um, while I think the intentions are really good, um, it became also very clear to me that the constraints that it puts on our operating budget and on the flexibility and um, or inflexibility of its use for the affordable housing trust, um, it, it's just not the correct path forward. So I, I fully endorse this path. Um, I um, hope that we can get the seven and a half million dollar override in addition to this. And I thank you for bringing it forward tonight. Thank you, Melissa. Brooke Moore, would you like to say some, to say some words? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. It takes it takes a second for that thing to pop up. Um, so I just have a, a couple of questions for Brian Turbot, perhaps um, that uh, just so I understand it uh, relative to the other options. the The stabilization fund requires a two thirds vote out, so that means that the trust cannot use that revenue um, for borrowing in order to front load projects to use it to, to finance borrowing, as I understand it. I would ask whether um, the money is being proposed here, the additional 1.5 million or so above um, the operating budget of 475 that was in 23, are also available in it, it, for us to front load um, financing a project in a way, if it, that, my question makes any sense. Um, Ahead, so, Brian. sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. To answer the question, um, I'll answer the second part first. The the 1.52, in theory, could yes be used to be put towards a borrowing. The only issue that we would encounter right now is that there's no borrowing authorization on the other than the seven and a half million dollars anticipated, and I. I don't think the intent, since we do have a debt exclusion companion ballot question for the seven and a half million is for that one and a half million to be put towards that. So in order to leverage any other borrowing money, we would have to, at a subsequent town meeting, authorize some type of borrowing that it would be understood that that money would be the, the beginning pieces to, to begin the repayment uh, when we permanently borrowed it. But the answer, the short answer is yes. The, the longer long-winded answer is without a subsequent borrowing authorization, we wouldn't have the authority to borrow. Um, with respect to the stabilization, there'd be nothing that would prohibit the town from putting a borrowing auth authorization forward. And just like we do in the enterprise fund or whatever would we'll say that it would be anticipated that the funds would come from that particular stabilization fund. But just as I had mentioned at the finance committee meeting on Monday, if the town put forward a request to withdraw money to pay debt service from that and it did not get the two thirds majority vote, that would have to come from the general fund or some other funding source to pay for that. So um, 
I, I, hopefully that answers your questions, Brooke. That, that, that does. Thanks, Brian. <clears throat> Thank you. Matt? Is the intent by doing 2 million in Article 8, is the intent that that will remain uh, yearly to housing or is this a one time? The intent would be to, as I um, probably didn't say it right, operationalize it so that it would remain an annual appropriation just like all the other departments. Um, just to add, there was some concern at FinCom about um, the need to provide a, a more of a breakdown of the detail of what that money would go for. And Tucker and I talked this afternoon about that and certainly a kind of a budget breakdown could be provided just very similar to all the other departments. Um, but it would, it would, the idea would be to start treating this like a department of the town, which it is. Yeah, and I think we've had a little bit of a delay in, in the recogni recognizing that. Um, and I, I really appreciate this approach. Christine? Thank you. Um, I, I also really appreciate the suggestion. I think it was very clear on Monday um, around the confusion of so many articles, which I know Matt uh, warned us about early on. Um, I have a follow-up question to Brooke's question. And it's, you said it doesn't currently allow us to borrow. We'd have to wait for a future town meeting. If for any reason that 7.5 million uh, didn't get approved at town meeting in the ballot, is there a way to add that language in now so that we have kind of a security um, you know, insurance so that we could use this? Um, there's a possibility. I would have to talk to the town manager to make sure that we were entirely comfortable with the way to do it, but there could be a potential possibility to do that. Um, it just, I, I would want to talk to the town manager before I came back and said, absolutely, there's a way to do it. Okay, thank you. Um, Rick Atherton? I, uh, Dawn, am I unmuted now? You are, Rick. Go ahead. Um, so, so this is a sort of a brand new proposal tonight. Um, I made some comments at the Finance Committee. Um, I might reiterate them now, but just another comment on Brian's reaction and mine to any attempt to front load what are operating monies in Article 8 Oh, uh, Greg, your your reception is not good. Okay. Oh, oh try, no, you're good now. It uh, might be uh, my interest. Yeah, I, I just think any attempt to uh, front load um, operating expenses, whether they're for housing or our island home, or for the landfill, or any other activity. Um, are fraught with difficulties. And I would uh, suggest to the board that you resist any attempt at that. When I look at uh, Tucker's presentation of how to get to annual and the final 10%, those ought to be achievable with good management by the town. And if the seven and a half million is not sufficient, you bring it back again next year. I continue to repeat that any uh, attempt to have ongoing consistent revenues from the land bank or from the short-term rentals, I think are fraught with difficulties when you haven't answered all the unknowns about the current construction and outlook for meeting the 10%. I think you also need to then commit, if you really want to do those kinds of things, that the citizens have an ability to understand where any commitment beyond the 10% takes us. I suspect we have at least 20% of affordable housing if you included the current housing availability through employers. And this is more a definitional problem, but I think it's clearly a community issue 
where employers have a primary responsibility to make sure people coming to the island are adequately compensated or housing is provided for them by their employers. Thank you. Matt? Yeah, no, uh, I, I think, I don't think we should get right to 10%. I think that we need to have a buffer and that is what's built in there. Uh, I will say the, you know, sometimes you hear, oh, that's difficult. Oh, this is really complex. This is really hard. A lot of times when people say that it's, uh, you know, it's kind of like, it, it really isn't, but they want you to, to do what they want you to do. But I will say that with this, you know, the, the, what Tucker is doing is really hard and he's doing a really good job at it. Uh, you know, getting us into Safe Harbor, keeping us in Safe Harbor and uh, in building a buffer, it, you know, is, it's not, it, it's a, it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort and I, you know, and I appreciate what he's done. I think, you know, there may be other ways to refine this in future years and things we're going to have to do. But I think for, you know, for what, you know, for hitting the ground running and doing it, I am in full agreement that he's, you know, we're doing the right thing. I sort of favor, I, I sort of favor Article 38, even with the stabilization part of it, because I, I don't favor it at a high percentage, but I favor it at a lower percentage. So, the existing people are kept, you know, ex existing recipients are kept, uh, you know, are kept neutral. I think there will be a lot of funds in that. And I think that would be a great year round, I mean, a great yearly uh, source of revenue that could be borrowed against eventually. And I think I look at the stabilization fund as a positive. If we're not doing a good job, the voters won't vote it out. If we're doing a great job, they're gonna, it, it's gonna just roll right over. So I look at it differently. Uh, I probably if, but if you know, if we're vote, if we're giving you know no votes to a you know to to all the other articles, you know, including non, including Article ninety seven, and and we're and we're going on to just two things, then I could support that. So, um, Brooke, and then Tucker, Brooke Moore. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I'd like to comment on the quantification of quote unquote affordable housing. 10% um, is our requirement by DHCD under chapter 40B. And there may well be hundreds of units of housing that are rented at reasonable rates, but that does not negate the fact that there are 480 people standing now on waiting lists for rentals and the covenant program. And so regardless of what exists and how it's defined, whether it's on our subsidized housing inventory or not, to me is irrelevant to the conversation we need to have regarding the massive shortage of supply of housing for our year round residents at all income levels. And nor does any of what's proposed in this subsidized housing inventory achievement goal address the question of home ownership. Um, we can't do another Sachem's path until we reach 10% under um, chapter 40B because we don't have the money to do another Sachem's path. But I can guarantee you there are that many times multiples of people who are in need of that kind of housing opportunity. So I don't wanna shortchange our community by thinking too small. Thank you. Thank you, Brooke. Um, Tucker, then Melissa. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just was going to pick up a little bit of something that Mr. Atherton said. I might not have done an adequate job earlier of describing um, sort of, you know, to come. So in order to, you know, we have the monies on hand through what was appropriated in 2019 to achieve our near-term safe harbor goals, as well as we have already really laid the foundation in terms of land for what we want to use a little further down the road for safe harbor. But what we don't have funding for at present is the subsidy that will be required in order to build those um, additional 
uh, units and safe harbor protections, if you will, out at Orange Street and at the UMass site. So really, you know, at a minimum, without talking about down payment assistance programs or other things that the trust is very interested in, in, in trying to provide to the community, kind of at a bare minimum order of magnitude, we're gonna need $20 million over the course of the next uh, three or four years. So the seven and a half that we are asking for in Article 24, plus the two that um, Brian and Libby um, have, you know, really wonderfully worked out. Uh, you know, that that is really kind of a down payment on on what we're trying to do, and we will need to come back for more. So I just wanted to be clear about that. Melissa, uh, thank you, Don. Um, I I just, you know, Matt, I really um, appreciate your comments about the stabilization fund and the, you know, the opportunity it provides us. I wonder if this is not the year to create that and to move forward with the seven and a half million dollar override, integrating what feels um, conservative and comfortable right now, at $2 million from our operating budget. But I don't think this is going to be the last time we have this conversation. And I think for future years, um, we can pick up this conversation of allocating money from the short term rental tax. And I think for just those kinds of purposes, a balance of operating funds and then, um, you know, this, this stabilization fund that needs town meetings vote and blessing to, to get out may be more prudent for subsequent years. We're, we're not on terra firma yet. I think we've got a great plan. And I think we've got a good um, forecast. Um, and I, to me, the, the creation of the stabilization fund is probably another year or two out for in a way that it will really truly complement the rest of the efforts we're, we're continuing today. Um, Howard Dickler. Howard. Can you hear me now? Yes, go ahead. Um, just a couple of comments. I think that, you know, uh, it's wonderful uh, that uh, Tucker has found a way for us to stay in safe harbor using the neighborhood first funds and the CPC funds. And there's a way forward if additional monies are passed. And that will get us to the 10% or maybe more with a buffer and that will keep us in safe harbor. But I don't want anybody to think that that is the total solution to the problem on the island. Because between affordable housing and the median price of a house is a whole host of island families that cannot afford a house. And we're talking about professionals that earn two salaries and they can't afford a two and a half million dollar house. So they're going to have to be other programs to help these people such as equity sharing or mortgage assistance. And those things are gonna cost money too. I'd also like to comment about the uh, short-term rental tax. I think the short-term rental tax is a new thing. Everything I've read said that the state intended that to be used for housing. I think the short-term rental tax is going to be many times the $2 million that is being suggested that be allocated from the town budget. I don't understand the whole concept of a hole in the town budget since this money did not exist before. So that means in some ways, some might say that the money was allocated to other things other than housing. So the town is in a sense going against the state's intent for that money. Thank you. Brian, then Matt. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just wanted to make the observation that at the meeting on Monday, um, I think that the FinCom chair asked me what I thought a percentage might be that would work um, relative to the potential stabilization fund. And we have about $5 million of room occupancy. I think everybody needs to, we need to remember that room occupancy is the actual tax that we collect. Granted, they, the state can tell us what comes from which percentage, but as an aggregate, we get one check. We don't get multiple checks for this. 
Um, and I had indicated to everyone on Monday that I thought that probably 25% or somewhere in that neighborhood, the minimum or just slightly above it would probably be able to work without creating um, a large amount of stress on the operating budget that I don't think anybody necessarily wants either. Um, and, and certainly affordable housing is, is a very critical need on the island. I just wanted to make the, the observation that the $2 million that the town manager and I have discussed and has been brought forward as a recommendation today is actually 28% of the actual receipts received to date from the room occupancy tax. So we, we were actually within the range that I had said before that I thought we could work within from the, the room occupancy tax itself. So I just wanted to let everybody know that that is to, to the question that Matt had asked, that, that is just under 30% of the tax that we have brought in to date. Um, Brian, can you just, I'll go to you in one second, Matt. Um, what is the percentage that the amount was prior to short-term rentals being included? Because the entire amount includes all of the lodging taxes. What, what was the percentage of what it is now that you got before short-term rentals were added. So are you asking what we received typically before 20 in 2019, which was the last year of yeah. the, um, I think it was around three and a half million dollars somewhere in there. If I, I'd, I'd have to go back so and look. But roughly it was, half. Roughly, roughly half. Roughly yeah. we counted on 50% of what mm -hmm. is now referred to as the short-term rental tax. Yeah. Right. in the town budget, because I think that that was part of the question is where is yes. the hole coming from? Because it's not just attributed to short-term rentals. It's attributed to all lodging. Right. Okay. Matt? Yeah, no, no my estimate was 30% just off the top of my head. So I'm, that was that was good. Uh, I, I think that Brooke has a really good point. Other towns that have been dealing with this longer and a bit more successfully, they target you know, somewhere around 30% of all of their housing for, for some level of affordability, whether it's just a year round covenant that it, it can be market rate, but year round or at various tiers, you know, so they are targeting 30% of their total, not 10% of their year round. So that, so that gives you an idea of where, you know, the extent of this issue. And that's where I think Brooke is correct. I think the direction you know, I, I'm fully support sort of where Tucker, how Tucker is doing it now and where we're going. But the direction we need to go is to be joint venturing with uh, people, not, you know, or to be have, doing it ourselves. There is, I have a buddy of mine just bought 60, he's, he's working for some investors, $60 million worth of housing in, in uh, Ohio. They're putting 30 to $40 million in. And in four years, they, they as investors will return uh, $25 million to themselves. There will be zero money down. They do not have to put a penny up for, this, uh, for, this develop, for these developments, for how they're doing it. So there's a, you know, it's tax credits and grants and a bunch of other money. And so I think that you know, we aren't at that level of complexity yet, but there are... Uh, Individuals on the island, two or three of the top individuals in the country, top principals in the country have summer homes here that could assist us, you know, and if we are building out a, you know, nonprofit housing arm, they could assist us and, and have us doing this in a way that works for the citizens and works for the taxpayers. And Tucker and I have talked about this. It's not something that, you know, we are set to do immediately. There's a lot to it, but I think, you know, once we get sort of, uh, you know, sort of once we get the shy figured out, once we get that protection sort of figured out, then I think there are other avenues we should be pursuing. Bob Fedoni. Can you? Bob, can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me now? Yep, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman, for the opportunity to speak as a member of the public. Um, I've been on the last three or four town meetings, and I'm heartened by the direction of this discussion. I was uh, kind of 
disappointed at some of the earlier meetings when um, it didn't appear that um, the crisis was really being taken as serious as some people say, oh yes, it is, it is, but there's no action. We've been on Nantucket part-time for over 20 years. We're here throughout the year. And during this time, we've learned about and watched the Nantucket shuffle by people doing all they can to live and work on Nantucket. Now, maybe over the last 10 years, we watched the Nantucket move off. Right now, our long-term caretaker contractor is thinking about throwing in the towel. After 20 years on Nantucket, he is exhausted. He has the work, but he's exhausted by trying to retain staff, by training people over and over again, only to have them quit and move off island because they cannot find affordable housing. He is a good human being. He helped his painter buy a house in Hyannis. Now his painter comes to the island for two or three days to work, sleeping on friends' couches wherever he can. Then he goes back to Hyannis to be with his family for a day or two. These are good people. They are good human beings. And what I suggest is that Nantucket has much more than an affordable housing crisis. Houses are things. When empty, they are just places. When people and families occupy houses, they become home. People, families in their homes make community. We have more than an affordable housing crisis on Nantucket. We have a community crisis. We have a humanitarian crisis. If a portion of the short-term rental tax could be used without endangering the finances of the town, and this issue is kicked down the stream again and again, I think it will be a disgrace. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bob. I really appreciated your comments. Um, Rick Atherton. Uh, Dawn, you know, can you hear me now? Yep, go ahead. Dawn, thank you. Just maybe a question to Matt or somebody else. Um, I just like to make sure when Matt talks about uh, 30%, I guess it sounds like he's talking about 30% that are subsidized by the taxpayers and that the employers who primarily bring landscapers, contractors, uh, other employees to the island as we grow, those folks who have taken the initiative to supply housing seasonal or year round are not included in your 30%. I just think we ought to be clear on that because to me, that's a very important contribution to affordable housing. Thank you. Um, Matt, do you wanna respond? Yeah, I can. No, no, Rick, that, those would be, uh, in a lot of these places, those would be included. There's also requirements. If you're building a, a third story on a building, you have to have, uh, you have that, then you can add an extra floor if all the housing on one, on one of the floors is affordable. There's uh, inclusionary zoning where, you know, if you're adding X amount of jobs, you have to have X amount of housing added. You know, they, they do it all different ways. You know, the number would be, you'd, we would be looking at, okay, what do, you know, businesses like NIR and myself and Reese, you know, Reese Gar and Trucking, what do those people supply? That would all be part of it. But the point I'm making is the number uh, that is needed is substantial. Uh, I liked Bob's earlier comments. I think he's, you know, he is, on, I, I liked how he described, it, you know, the, the problem that we have. He did it really well. I was really fortunate in about 2002, I met uh, with Walter Barnicky. I think he died in about 04. And he, you know, he talked about things he had done and he had some great old stories. But one of his warnings that he had to me at the time was that uh, Nantucket was not viewing their homes as homes. We were viewing them as investments and as, uh, and and as mini hotels. And he said that will, you know, that would be, if he could change one thing, that was one of the main thing he would change. And when Walter went and he advised the Lagazi family in Newburyport, Mass, 
he advised them not to follow the model that Nantucket has chosen. Don't make every single home a, you know, a hotel, a mini hotel. You know, do not do that. That will harm your community. And, you know, it's pretty prescient when you look back 20 years, you know, he had a great vision. He, you know, he did a lot for Nantucket. He was right. And we're going to have a harder time digging out from this going forward than, than we think. There's a lot of, you know, a lot of self-interest and a lot of, uh, you know, sort of momentum against doing some of the things that we may need to do. So, you know, I, I, I wouldn't kid myself that we're going to, that this is going to be easy to be able to get, you know, to be able to retain community and get enough housing stock. I, I think, you know, I, I think that's not going to be very easy at all, but I think it's something that we need to continue to talk about and, and actually make, take action on. Um, can I just make a quick comment um, in regard to like the, the employee housing situation? I mean, I think that there's a lot of employers on the island who are providing housing and doing, you know, doing very much the best they can to do that. But it's most of it is to accommodate the seasonality of our economy. Um, most of the employee housing that I'm aware of is more sh shared housing, say room room rentals um, for the massive influx. Um, that's just a, the nature of a, of a tourist island that's super busy 10 weeks out of the year and then tapers off into where we are in the season now. And I just don't think it's exactly the same type of housing that we're talking about for um, our year round population that's necessary. Um, it's not where people necessarily want to stay long term. It's when they're coming here for six months out of the year, nine months out of the year, um, or more more temporarily when they're starting a job um, and then trying to move into a better situation. It's not that employers don't, in some scenarios, provide like full apartments but most of the time you are sharing with another per with another person or other people. And um, I think there kind there's kind of two separate things going on. I guess that wasn't a, su a super quick comment, but um, there's the, I think it's a, that's a little, it differs a little bit for some of the problems that we're trying to address with this funding. Christy, and then I have a couple more public hands up. Thank you. And I wanted to comment on the employee housing as well. And I think we can't take the pressure off of this board in the town to support affordable housing just because we feel that the owner should be on employers. I know that many do um, do what they can, but you know I've worked with many of our small business owners on the island and their number one concern is employee housing. They cannot retain staff when people are moving you know, every six months, I'm one of those people who nearly left the island because I couldn't find housing. It's it's not sustainable. And it's great for long-term businesses like Matt's, who's been able to purchase and provide employee housing, but new businesses are not able to do that, especially when we have these $2.5 million homes, you know, single family homes, they can't staff their employers there. And, you know, Nantucket has always been an entrepreneurial town and that's not going to continue if we don't have places for people to live. And so, you know, I think that Bob made a really great comment about a community crisis and it's it's housing, but it's also our workforce and our main streets and our downtown and everything is affected because we don't have adequate housing for our year round staff. So I just wanted to make that comment that it's it's important to look at employer housing, but it can't be all, all the pressure put on employers to provide it. The town has to step in as well. Brooke Moore. Hi, thank you uh, again, Madam Chair. I just wanted to make a couple additional points um, that may uh, need some clarification for the community. The, 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 the path to 10% under Chapter 40B is, a, is now four years hence. And that is because half of our um, subsidized housing inventory will be built out by Richmond Development Corporation. And so we can't, um, expedite the remaining units because we have to do this odd thing of maintaining safe harbor at 24 units a year. So we have to do sort of parallel roads along with Richmond. 
And uh, Richmond's, you know, gonna, is making a huge contribution to our subsidized housing inventory, and that is also set the timeline for the earliest we can complete this um, project of getting to 10%. My fear is that if we have to wait till 2025 and think of we've got to do that, complete that job before we can think of anything else, how many people are going to leave because we haven't provided the funding to start doing some creative new programs that, that may fall out of the subsidized housing inventory, but contribute to what Matt talks to, which is a, which is a larger percentage of, of housing. And to me, the definition of that is to have an adequate supply so that you might live in a shared apartment with employer, in other employees when you arrive, but you meet a partner and you join as a couple and you wanna get a place of your own. And then maybe you have a child or two children. Where do you go? And this community needs an adequate supply of housing for people whose circumstances change over time, both as they, as they age, grow their families, and then as their children leave and they wanna downsize. There's also no housing for friends of mine who wanna retire, will not be able to afford their homes, and there's nowhere for them to go on Nantucket. So this is both up and down this property ladder that I often refer to. And, um, and I think that that's an important thing for us to remember. Um, and, and the goal here is to have a, an adequate supply of housing, all types, rental and home ownership that are available only in perpetuity to our year round community in various ways. And that's the long-term goal. And I just don't wanna wait five years to start working on the rest of this because very important people are gonna be lost in the meantime. Thank you. Thank you, Brooke. Rick Atherton. All right, Dawn, am I back again? Yes. Thank you. Um, you know, it's interesting. This discussion is a, is a good discussion, but I think it emphasizes the need for the board to, you know, I'm not sure what the right phrase is, appoint a committee. It sort of reminds me of the fertilizer, Article 68, uh, what, 10 years ago. A very important community initiative to help save our environment in that case, and here to save our year-round community. And there are many, many variables which are not on the table tonight, not openly discussed, like how many of our year-round housing units are in effect being converted to short-term rental units. So I think you need to, along perhaps with your planning department, get some facts together. Where are we headed? Have an open discussion on all the variables before you come to some kind of resolution on the proper financing and goals of the community. Thank you. Um, we're not making a decision tonight, as, as far as I'm concerned. This was a preliminary discussion. We usually save our select board comments to a little bit closer to town meeting after the FinCom has done further review. And um, this is a, there's an entirely new proposal on the table that I'd like feedback from the Finance Committee on. Um, Denise is here tonight listening. Um, and... Um, I, th I think that you know there is more information that is uh, that is being gathered um, to talk about further variables, as Rick mentioned. So th this is the beginning of a conversation. We thought it was appropriate to have a direct conversation just about these warrant articles um, with some extra time that we had tonight. Melissa, uh, thanks, Don. So I guess I have two questions or a question and a comment. Um, and I'll do the comment first, which is that um, it's my understanding that the Affordable Housing Trust Fund is the committee with board representation on it that is examining these variables. So um, I'm not sure that there's bandwidth for a subsequent um, committee unless we're talking about that you know, specific economic development data, which I do hope and encourage the Planning and Economic Development Commission Christy, sorry, I know you sit on both, um, but to start to look at some of those um, impact statements that have come up, particularly around 
um, some of the suggestions that Act Now has put forth in, in Article 90 um, in terms of impact of short-term rentals and sustainability. I, I agree with Rick that there may need to be a 30,000 foot view scope and, and that responsibility may rest with that um, commission. Um, but I guess my comment tonight is, are you, or question tonight is, Don, are you looking for um, consensus from this board to help shape finance committee? Because I'm, I'm not sure that we've, um, you know, I, I don't know what your, what, what direction we're trying to, or what we're trying to influence through this discussion tonight. Um, I think that we could move towards some consensus in the ideas that we've heard, but I also don't know if it's appropriate to make any kind of a motion at this point because we just got this new idea put on the table. Um, and I think the board should should think on it a bit. Um, Jason, then Denise. Thank you. Uh, I've been listening for a while. I really, this is like, a, you know, when Don and I meet agenda meetings, I've we said we really need a good discussion on housing, not to make any motions, not to just to have just to talk and you know listen to the public and and have a, a great dialogue. And I think we are. Uh, so so I, some of my thoughts. Um, I don't think I, I want to push the FinCom or in any certain direction. And it's it's checks and balances. It needs to be very separate. So I don't want to instruct them, you know, or uh, influence them to do anything. I think Don our original idea was we thought that the FinCon would have their motions done already, right, this past Monday, but because of the uh, the situation with emails and stuff, it, it wasn't done. It was pushed a little further out. So that's what we put on the agenda because we thought the FinCon motions would be there and we could discuss those. So it, I just want to make sure, be clear that we weren't trying to influence uh, by putting this on the agenda anyway, influence the FinCon. Uh, my thoughts on the stabilization fund, at first I was Two high fives uh, when Arthur Reed brought that article in. I was like, okay, it's what the state intended. It's what most of us here talked about when the short-term rental tax conversation came up. That's what you know Tucker and Brooke and Affordable Housing Trust had heard us say like, okay, it's going to go to infrastructure and housing, whatever that extra amount is. Now that I understand it better, it's not as flexible and you can't borrow against it and it, it could that money could sit there for two or three years if we can't if town meeting can't decide what that funding should go to so i'm a little less reluctant for it to pass if it does i would hopefully somebody could put an amendment which i think arthur reed did say he would push it out a year i think that, that's i think that's smart especially if we put in two million through operating for one year and, and that does start in subsequent years then we can make movements so i like the flexibility i think the affordable housing trust in town administration select board, we, we need to be flexible because there is a plan for safe harbor and 10%, but that's that's only one part of it. It's just phase one. And um, living in employee housing for six or seven years, owning small businesses and trying to, you know, you know, putting bike tour guides in my spare bedroom, you know, because I couldn't put them any, you know, the business wouldn't survive if I had to pay for their housing for small businesses, it doesn't work. It does play a part. We do need the seasonality, but it doesn't give what Mr. Bedoni was saying is, is, is a home, right? As soon as you want to, you know, start a family, you have to leave the island because you don't want to be only stuck in, not stuck, but it's nice when an employer can give you housing, but when your housing is only contingent on where you work. You can't leave, right? That's not, that's not the secure feeling that I want all of our community to have long-term, but it's a good solution um, temporarily. And then uh, I guess I just, I just want to say, that I think we, we really need to start having a discussion of pushing. I, I mean, I see it every day. I feel confident that we have the, the temper, you know, the 10%, we have the model, they, you know, if we can, get these, this funding passed, we can stay in safe harbor and we can get the 490 and 525. And, but that's, I feel like that's just the start. But maybe we need new numbers, right? So there's a 10%, but overall we are shooting for the 30% mat. That includes employer housing and it includes covenant homes. And, and we have a, a bigger number. I think that would be really interesting to, to look at. Um, I think that's it for now. Thanks, Jason, great thoughts. Denise? 
Thank you. Thank you, Dawn. Um, I'm attending tonight on this discussion to really hear what all of you think. It doesn't, as Jason very rightly pointed out, it doesn't give me any quote unquote instruction as to how to bring our motions forward on these articles. It's more to get an understanding of, you know, the select board's ideas behind it and some of the other topics. Um, we did have an action packed finance committee meeting on Monday. And um, we've had a couple of them this season. I think Zoom is bringing out lots of engagement, which I actually find to be excellent. And we will be discussing these articles, hopefully uh, just moving to deliberation and motions on March 23rd, because at this point, I think we've gotten all the information we need to get. We did, we did to Jason's point, we thought we would be able to do it Monday. However, uh, with the email being down, I have gotten, I've got something like 130 emails sitting there unopened yet uh, of people's um, opinions on Article 97 specifically. So I, we just felt it wasn't fair to go to motion on any of these articles. And we absolutely did bundle them together, just like you have tonight, to discuss them in context of, of a more holistic, even though we will make motions on each individual one. So um, I did like the, the suggestion that was brought forward today of having $2 million in the operating budget as a, as a way to do this. I think that makes a lot of sense. And uh, I look forward to you know, exploring that more fully with the finance committee on March 23rd. And I thank all of you and um, Tucker, you've been a great help in this discussion for us as has Brooke. So thank you very much, everyone. Um I just like to throw out there right now how I feel on each on each of these. I think it might might be helpful to others, and I'm certainly open to changing my mind on things. But um, my current position is um, I'd like to see Article 23 combined into the the two million that would be part of Article 8 um, with a detailed budget on how, a detailed breakdown on that. Um, I support Article 24, the $7.5 million borrowing. However, I am always leery about putting all our eggs in a basket that requires a ballot vote. Um, so I proceed with caution on that, on whether we will it will actually fully come to fruition. I think that we, that we will get the support at town meeting, but I, I'm always worried about the ballot box um, for large asks like that. Um, Article 38, um, we, we talked about the stabilization fund ourselves in regard to pre, um, presenting it as an option. I, I think that there are positives to it, um, but I am worried about the lack of, it's not nimble enough um, for the affordable housing trust fund to really compete in the housing market. I think it could be a, a source going forward if that, is where people are heading. What I would very much like to see is an amendment to it, lowering the amount to 25% and pushing the start date out a year. Um, meanwhile, appropriating the 2 million out of the general fund this year. Um, Article 97, I do not support. I've talked about this in the past. I don't, I, I believe that the land bank has a very important mission. I think that there's been some somewhat of an expansion of their mission with the the concerns on coastal resiliency and there's some very expensive properties that they could play a big part in and um, maybe sometime in the future we'll have a discussion about lowering the land bank tax but i don't really want to tie it to housing i think that we need to fund housing separately um, and, and have the land bank stand on its own so th those are my thoughts. If any other board members want to throw stuff out there, feel free. If any other public want to say anything before we move on to committee reports, feel free. Tucker, then Christy. I want to let Christy go first. Christy. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I just want to say I really enjoyed the amount of articles that were presented by our citizens this year. I think the last couple of years, it's we've been talking about we need funding for affordable housing, and there hasn't been a lot of 
discussion around it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm very clear that I ran for select board because I was frustrated by the past boards not committing. Um, this is a priority and now it's our number one priority. So I'm very pleased by that. And having these different articles has really brought us into conversations. It's shown, you know, Tucker how to lay out the plan for the next five years. And you, we didn't have that two years ago. Even when we had the neighborhood first um, article in front of us, we didn't know how we would get into safe harbor or how we were going to reach the 10%. And so we've come a long way in two years. And I really hope that the voters can, you know, replay this video and all the other materials that the Affordable Housing Trust Fund puts forth to understand that we really have a solid plan to stay in safe harbor and to produce affordable housing and you know, be able to um, move into what we've been discussing a lot tonight of, of other ways of ownership. So I hope that we pr provide enough tools to get the vote at town meeting. Um, I'm very similar to you, um, Don, with everything that you laid out in terms of recommendations. Um, and in terms of Article 97, just the one comment, I know that um, Denise just brought up the number of emails that there was a form letter that went around and I just would like, like to have emails come from people's emails accounts so that we can respond back and have interactions. As an elected official, I really like to hear from our constituents and then have conversations. Oh. Dawn, may I just jump in quickly? Yes, of, Denise, please do. Of, of the of one, I got over a hundred emails on this, Christy, and every single one was unique. None of them were form letters and they were all people because I'm responding back to, you know, dear John, dear Susan, dear everybody. So I didn't, it's funny because you all say that there's all these form letters floating around and I didn't get a single form letter, just so everyone knows I've gotten individual emails from people. So they, they do exist. <laughs> Matt? Denise, I, th uh, Denise, I think some of them look like they're, they're a form letter, but some of them have people's names. But when you click on it, it their name is their name is in the email underneath. So there, you know, there's a lot that are, you know, and they look like they're copy and pasted. So I, I agree with Christy, but I think people still, have, I, I wouldn't discount them because people still have to make the effort to, uh, you know, to go on the site and, and, and feel strongly enough to go on it and do it. So I think that, you know, that for sure, it, it's, it's out there. Uh, I favor 38, you know, at 25 or 30% over 20, over the seven and a half million, I think, you know, and if we could amend it to be a lower amount or amend it to avoid the stabilization because it's a yearly amount of money, I think that's a better way to do it. But I'm not going to die on that hill. I don't favor 97 right from the beginning. I worry about a ballot vote. I, I, I really, you know, I think I worry about the ballot vote. I worry about what, you know, the talk at town meeting, you know, if people come uh, loaded for bear and the conversation goes negative. Uh, I've seen that just carry forward through that town meeting, carry right to the ballot. So I think it's, you know, as I've said before, it's really important that we sort it out. And I'm glad we're having this conversation to get where we can sort it. Uh, and I think the 2 million, I, I support the 2 million uh, because I think that if one, if one or both of these things go south, at least we're okay for the year. So, you know, so I think that, you know, I think that would be that. So I, I would be saying there's two or three we should be giving strong, uh, you know, at least two, maybe three should be giving strong recommendations. And I think a couple we should be giving strong negatives. Um, I had Julie Gesner with her hands up, hand up for a few minutes and then I'll go to you, Melissa. Um, Julie. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes, go ahead. Great, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. And, and I just really wanted to make a comment about the, the emails, um, Denise and Matt specifically, I did send you both emails. Um, Don, I may have also sent you an email. I, I apologize if I don't remember, but I did get responses from both of you. So thank you very much for replying. And um, you know, it, it's a very, Article 97 is very concerning to me. And so it was nice to know that my emails had been read and that you guys are considering them seriously. Um, as a voice of the community. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. The, the email response to Article 97 has been, uh, been overwhelming. Um, that my inbox is very, very full. 
Um, so that's, I mean, I, I always appreciate that because it gives us a real temperature of the community. And if you don't get a response, don't think that we're not hearing you. Um, it, there's, we get a lot of emails and a lot of other, other things. Melissa? Uh, yeah, thank you, Don. And thanks for mentioning that. Um, I, um, I think also because of the email server issues, um, all of a sudden, I think it was Monday morning, my inbox um, and just given the balance of other obligations, I have not had a chance to respond to everybody who's emailed, but um, they have been received and um, opinions noted. So thank you for sending them. Um, I just wanted to say that, you know, um, in addition to um, the housing issues and affordable housing issues, we have a quality of life um, charge in our strategic plan. And I think, you know, just ruminating a little bit more on, on Rick's comments, I think a lot of what we're hearing from um, the Citizen Warrant articles, both last year and this year, are trying to address quality of life issues. And I think we need to have some more substantive conversations as a board around what those issues are that are affecting our quality of life. Um, Certainly for a lot of, and, and I don't want to go through each one of them, but I, I think that, you know, when we are not addressing them as a board, we see more citizen participation and ideas coming forward. And I think that's really what we've, we've seen is that these high market values of homes are pushing our middle class folks out and it's disrupting quality of life. Um, for a great number of members of our community. So I just offer that as a, um, I, I don't know how we structure that as a board or structure that conversation, but I think we need to put some attention into that once we get through this town meeting. Um, I am also not in support of Article 97. Um, I think it's a, um, a valiant um, idea by a very good community member and a passionate one. And I also think that that um, introduction of that article has brought forth a lot of um, other ideas to protect the sanctity of the land bank um, uh, percentage, um, but offering alternative solutions. So while I'm thankful for the idea and, and the ideas it's inspired, um, I'm not in favor of it. Um, I'm also concerned about um, ballot votes, but I, I think that, you know, Tucker and the Affordable Housing Trust, I, I contended that you have a very large marketing problem um, in front of you, as well as a funding solution problem, because that's how um, voters are going to gain trust that this money is necessary, um, is that your good communication and your um, clarity of the ask. And so um, I, I'm in favor of that. And again, I'm, I'm in favor of the $2 million. Um, I, I sincerely hope that that's something that we can do. Um, I think it's in fact a bit overdue um, in that we've known that this short-term rental money was coming in. I don't know that we knew that how successful it would be for us as a community. And arguably, again, this year is not a benchmark, but it's time for us to consider this department a, a functioning department um, of, of our operations. And um, if you know three or four articles on the warrant haven't told us that this is important to the community and we need to, to fund this operationally, um, uh, I don't know what else would. So I, I agree with that. Um, and thanks for sharing your comments, Don. Um, I, I do think um, you know it's, uh, our collective leadership on this is going to help the voters make the right decisions that they feel are in the best interest of the community. So thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Um, Brooke Morris had her hand up for a minute and then I'll go to you, Christy. Brooke. Thank you again, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I'm speaking now as the sponsor of Article 97. Um, and I wanted to um, talk a little bit about why I proposed the article and with the group of people who have been supporting me in this process um, since the idea was conceived. And the truth of the matter is it was, um, it was an effort to start this conversation um, that hadn't been happening at the level that I knew as a housing advocate here for a number of years now um, needed to happen in terms of 
the need for funding for affordable housing. And um, I still stand by um, the, the basis for the article in that um, in 1983, when the land bank was conceived, um, there were two problems the community was facing. Um, the idea of overdevelopment and the lack of conservation and concerns about year round and affordable housing, which having done a deep dive into the Inquirer and Mirror archives going back to 1980, um, found that they were considered um, both very serious concerns of the community. And my logic is that we have now invested over $400 million or will have, including the $39 million the land bank has currently cash on hand um, in conservation. 51.7% of Nantucket is conserved. The available land on Nantucket in 1987 was 53%. It currently stands at 4.8%. There isn't a lot of vacant land available for conservation anymore, but that also means that there's a shrinking supply of real estate to solve our housing needs. And so the logic of my article is that that revenue stream be shared from a, an effort that's had a 40 year head start to solve a problem that has existed for the same amount of time, nearly 40 years. So I just wanna be clear about the financials of this situation. The land bank revenue in the last five years has averaged $20 million. Their current operating budget runs at about $3 million if you take out debt service, which with $39 million in the bank currently and $16 million of debt, could be taken care of tomorrow and no longer be an ongoing expense to the land bank. So that leaves them on an average basis, a net revenue of nearly $17 million over expenses. And what I'm proposing is we leave them with $12 million for 20 years instead of $17 million in order to substantially and finally get to the problem that has been here as long as the land bank has been in our midst. And so I posit to all of you and to the community that this is a reasonable alternative that will not impair land bank operations. It will not impair the golf clubs. It will not impair the playgrounds. It will not impair trail management. The land bank will continue to function. The pace at which it acquires the shrinking supply of land, yes, that will be affected. So the question is, is there an equal importance to substantially investing in our people in the crisis that our community is facing? as an alternative to continuing at the pace that the land bank has had for nearly 40 years. So I just wanted to share that since we spent a lot of time on other things tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Brooke. I really appreciate you making those comments. Um, Christy? Thank you. Um, I have internet back, so I'm not really sure what was heard before in my comments, but I just wanted to mention you know, especially after hearing from Brooke, it was, you know, it was a very good idea to start thinking about long-term funding. And we've been talking about this with the Affordable Housing Trust Fund of short-term versus long-term. And the $2 million is definitely a great start. And I love that this conversation um, was started tonight with that um, contribution. And when we're looking at some of these bigger initiatives that we're, we've been talking about all night, it's looking at about $5 million a year. So we all have to start thinking creatively and you know, I'm not saying it needs to be you know, right now, but over the next year or two about how can we start something that the voters would like that, you know, that can pass the state legislature that can provide that funding source because it's needed. And right now there's nowhere to get it. Um, 
you know, the, the housing bank bill is, is brilliant in my opinion, and we can't get it passed through. And we've approved it, I think, six times over the last 11 years, and we can't get it um, passed up at the state house. And so, you know, everything that we're bringing forward, we keep running into a barrier somewhere. So we have to keep trying and keep bringing these ideas forward. So, you know, even if this doesn't pass at, land, at um, town meeting, I hope that citizens continue to start thinking creatively about what, what can we use and how can we use our assets like the high value of real estate to bring in these revenues for affordable housing. So I just want to put that out there to, to keep thinking creatively. Thank you. Thank you, Christy. Um, Tucker? Yeah, thank you um, very much. Um, just three quick things. Um, one, um, I mean, I will just mention there is a significant um, effort underway with regard to not only our housing bank bill, but statewide enabling legislation. There is a statewide coalition that is has meetings basically two or three times a week at this juncture. This has become a, a major initiative for a lot of communities, including Boston. And by, you know, and not by any stretch trying to say it's going to happen, but the momentum uh, behind something like this has certainly never been greater. Um, the second thing I was going to say with regard to Safe Harbor, um, it's it's not just voting for funding and sending in a LAO application. I mean, we, we have to um, not get in our own way with regard to permitting and supporting um, these developments, which we've identified can contribute toward that. And there also are factors outside of our control in terms of how DHCD moves and so forth. So we, you know, we're, we believe we're doing all the right things, but it's important that we continue to do those things that we think are going to uh, get us across the finish line. Um, and the last thing I wanted to say, and I am going to apologize in advance if I completely and totally mess this up, um, but I'm going to borrow from uh, someone who I heard at a meeting one time <clears throat> say uh, <clears throat> when he was a kid, he read a, a lot of comic books. And he read a lot of comic books about superheroes. And as he was in this meeting with what you might otherwise consider to be ordinary people, he said, you know, when I was young and I read all these comic books, I wanted to grow up and be with superheroes. And I am. And I think if for me, when I look around this meeting, the finance committee meeting, the meetings of the trust, the neighborhood first advisory committee, so many, the planning board, the agent, I mean, so many groups here, this entire community really, um, and I have to include, especially Vicki Marsh from town council's office, but town council's office in general. Um, I, I just feel the same way. I, I feel like we are surrounded by superheroes with a special superhero shout out tonight to Bob Bedoni, my new superhero. Thank you. Thank you, Tucker. Um, Deanne Atherton's had her hands up, hand up for a couple of minutes. Deanne, did you want to make a couple comments before we wrap up? Yes, Madam Chair, I'll be, I'll be very brief. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. I just, I'm so glad that the issue of the housing bank has come up. Um, I listened to the affordable housing trust meeting. I think it was last week, I'm losing track of time. And uh, 
Tucker was away, but Brian Sullivan uh, reported to the committee that Martha's Vineyard had hired a lobbyist to help them with their housing bank bill. And I would hope that we would consider doing that, that I think the housing bank is a very appropriate way for us to have ongoing funding for affordable housing. And I think any money being spent to hire a professional to help us get this enacted into law would be money well worth spent. Thank you. Thank you, Deanne. We have had some conversations about that. Um, appreciate your comments. And um, Tucker, very much appreciate your last comments. And um, I'm so glad that this board right now is, um, is continuing to make housing a number one priority. And um, we maintain a very cohesive approach um, with our strategic planning. And I just think it's all been incredibly positive. And I'm so excited to start to see some results. <laughs> Um, it takes time and the community doesn't see it right away, but, but we are making a lot of strides and this has been a really rough year um, with, with all of the extra things that got thrown at us, not, and I don't mean us, I mean us as a community and a world. Um, so um, Matt, did you want to want to make another comment? Follow up to Deanne's. I think the covenant home Am I, you know, I'm old, my memory might be gone, but I think we may have had a lobbyist when we did the Covenant Home way back. You know, it was right after the comprehensive plan and it was one of the uh, initiatives that came out of that document. And I believe that we hooked up with a couple other communities and, and they helped us, you know, push that through. So I think that is a good, uh, and I could be wrong, maybe it's a, there was another one later and I'm mixing them up, but, you know, I think that might be a, a good suggestion because it is important enough. And if, you know, if we could do it, and I think Somerville's put something forward and the vineyard and a few other communities, maybe all of us together should be, you know, united to try to do this. I believe even Boston has signed on at this stage. So it's, the whole picture is looking up significantly. Tucker? Just super briefly, yeah. Um, so the vineyard has hired a, like a local coordinator to coordinate their transfer fee um, activity, not a lobbyist per se, but that person, Laura Silver and I are in regular touch and are part of the steering committee for the transfer fee coalition. We're meeting with Senator Commerford, who's the Senate sponsor of the statewide enabling legislation in a couple of weeks. And a lobbyist is one of the central items we're going to be speaking about in terms of the overall strategy to move things through. Excellent. Thank you. Um, is there anything else from anybody tonight? We'll, we'll continue to take up a discussion on, on any select board comments on Warren articles. We don't necessarily comment on any of them since the finance committee and the planning board have those covered, but occasionally We'll, we'll add a select board piece, um, but, um, but I think this ends this tonight, or Jason? Yeah, I just kind of want to echo some of the things everybody's saying here at the end is it, uh, this, this should be our number one priority, and we should advocate for those who need secure housing. The majority, I'm not saying that pe there's uh, people here that maybe are, are on this, this call that are renting, but the majority of people that we come in contact with, that we get emails from, own homes, right? So the people that we need to think about and speak for and advocate for are those who, who don't have homes and don't even know we're talking about this tonight because they're working two or three jobs and they're worried about where they're going to be in five or six months. You know, so I think it's, you know, there's been times where we, we bring something up once a month. We talk about whatever it is, real estate. I mean, this housing should be, a, you know, a monthly longer conversation like this. And it's heading in the right direction. And um, so I agree with pretty much what everybody's saying about 23, 24 and 38. Uh, I don't really support 38 unless we can't get the 2 million through in the operating. It's just complicated and not flexible, but it's better than, than nothing on 38. Article 97, I'm probably the only one here that, likes the discussion 
I think it should go to town meeting. I think we should have a healthy discussion. I don't know, man, we'd be in big trouble if we didn't have the land bank. You know, I, there's that one graph where it shows, you know, from the eighties on developed land. And uh, it's, it's, it's unbelievable to think if we did have the land bank, I think we can have a duality of thought. I think you can be f for the land bank and for housing. So I don't think anybody who's sent us those letters are against housing. And I don't want anybody to think that if I'm for a discussion on this potential change for a land bank, that I'm not for the land bank either. All right. I think, it, I think it works both ways. And I think it's a healthy discussion and we may not need to do it. If the, if the transfer fee on the, the housing bill, if it, if it comes through, but I will be curious to see at town meeting what happens if it's 95 five against article 97, then, then we'll know like that was not the move. Our community doesn't want it. But I think when you, you need know, everybody's, I think people said this before, you know, if you want to, know someone's values, you look at their budget, whether that's a nonprofit or a municipality or even a business for profit, right? And up until recently, we our values are not for housing. We have not put any money to it. Now, Neighborhood First changed that. We started it a couple of years ago. We're really getting into it now. But if we're not going to do it, if it's not 2 million a year, we're not doing budget overrides, you know, where is it going to be? So I, I think it's a healthy discussion, but, um, and I'm, and I liked the discussion at FinCon the other night. I thought it was really, really good on, on all different sides and aspects. So I just wanted to put that out there. Thanks. Thank you, Jason. Oh, Matt. The confirmation I was right. Uh, the, the lobbyist was hired for uh, Housing Covenant and that was successful. Someone texted me and you know confirmed. Thank you. All right, I'm, I'm going to wrap this up for tonight and um, move on to any additional committee reports. Melissa? Thanks, Don. I, I just wanted to um, expand on Christie's report on the rock solid fund applications. Those are open through March 29th. And um, we've had businesses um, contact the chamber with um, interest or ideas or questions. And I just encourage more of that. Um, if you feel, if, you, if you're a business, uh, business owner and you read the description and you have some questions, please reach out to Karen May Cumber at the chamber for clarification. Um, I think the town has invested this money in the grants for the businesses and we really want to encourage a lot of, um, a lot of ideas to come forward. Um, so please don't be shy to reach out for guidance on the application. Thank you. Any other committee reports? Could I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. <laughs> um, by roll call, Melissa Murphy. Aye. Christy Farantella. Aye. Matt Fay. Aye. Jason Bridges. Aye. Don Holgate, aye. Thank you. John Giorgio, thanks for sitting through our whole meeting tonight. <laughs> Looking good too. Um, thanks everyone.